Welcome, Jacob. We're looking forward to your talk. And whenever you are ready, go on ahead. Anna, thank you very much for having me. It's, um, it's a pleasure for, uh, for me to, uh, to talk to this audience because I know uh, that many people are fascinated by uh, Russian history uh, as I am, but, um, but uh, they tend to be spread out all over the world. It's a very international um, thing that we're going to discuss tonight. Um, it's, it's always frustrating to, uh, to speak uh, for, uh, for just one hour, <laughs> how long we'll keep going. Um, because there's so much that, that I can't include. But what I can tell you is that, that this is sort of two presentations in one, because I've written um, or contributed to two books about this subject today. The first one <clears throat> came out a couple of years ago. Uh, it's one that you see on your screen right now. Uh, it's a uh, biography of the uh, Imperial Russian general, uh, Paul Gudim Levkovich. Uh, it's appeared in Danish only so far, but maybe perhaps uh, I can have it translated. Um, I hope so. And <clears throat> it's a story of this general's life and uh, and uh, how he came to Denmark and, and how he brought his his collection to Denmark and whenever people ask me what what is this uh, story I I tend to say that it's um, it's sort of um, Dr. Shivago meets Downton Abbey uh, it's a um, it's it's a life and times uh, story set in in a milieu that that reminds reminds me of of I guess Downton Abbey uh, the the it's 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 the high society in 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 Britain and in uh, in France and in in Denmark and 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 indeed in Russia and it encompasses uh, royalty and the Russian imperial family and uh, the rich and famous, but also just regular soldiers who uh, were caught up in, a, um, in some very eventful years uh, around World War I. Um, it all happened, uh, or it all began with my my job as a curator, a curator at the uh, Danish War Museum, uh, formerly known as the uh, Royal Danish Arsenal Museum in, in Copenhagen. Uh, back in 2012, 2013, we were preparing uh, an entirely new exhibition, um, which would show uh, history of Danish warfare and military, uh, but also showcase some of the more um, interesting collections of, of the museum. And among them were this, was this Russian, um, uh, Russian collection that I really didn't know very much about, but uh, I, someone had to, <laughs> and uh, and and I I sort of jumped uh, because I I was always been very fascinated with Russia and and there is this uh, link between Danish and Russian history uh, in that the um, the 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 Tsarina uh, Maria Fyodorovna the, the the mother of of Nicholas II the last Tsar was was born as uh, a Danish princess. So, um, so and I, I, I saw that this collection had something with her and her period to, to so, so I thought that this, this is interesting. I, 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 I'd like to, to know more. Uh, and I immediately saw that this was very much about uniforms, a lot of uh, fantastic uniforms. Um, it, 
it, it isn't like this anymore. But back then, <laughs> when you went to the to the attic, to the loft of the uh, this huge uh, uh, Renaissance building that is the, uh, the 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 Danish Arsenal, the Copenhagen Arsenal, from from uh, just around year sixteen hundred, that there were on uh, th three uh, stories there were cupboards. Cupboard after cupboard after cupboard. So it's I don't know how many kilometers of cupboards there were, um, but in them on hangers there was uh, uniforms from, of course, the the Danish military, but also from various other international mil militaries, and uh, four of these double closets held a huge collection of imperial Russian uniforms. <laughs> And I was just gripped by them the moment I just opened those uh, cupboard doors. I, I was so fascinated with the, the colors and the, the, the exquisite quality, the, 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 the gold braid, the, the, the details. I, I, I could tell this was, this was a really uh, outstanding collection. And, and it's it, it's like this that um, back in the back in the 1950s, they they had uh, sort of made sure that it wouldn't the the, the collection wouldn't be be um, infested with uh, with insects. It, it's basically been powdered with uh, with some very poisonous stuff, uh, DDT, and um, all the insects died, but uh, it. it Certainly wasn't very healthy to work with the with the uniforms, but um, it kept them in a very pristine condition, and they weren't um, on display for uh, for many 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 years. So so they are among the best preserved uh, uniform items of their kind in the world, even even outside of Russia. Um, and I'll introduce uh, some of them, but but. There are so many, so um, uh, you'll have to buy the catalog. <laughs> I also found when I did my research that there was much more. It wasn't only these uh, uniforms. It was also uh, a treasure trove of um, photographs, many of them um, portraits of, to me, completely unknown um, Military officers, many of them with um, inscriptions on the on the reverse in Russian handwriting, pre-revolution <laughs> handwriting, and I know very little Russian. I'd love to know more, but uh, but I, Russian is difficult. Uh, I know Danish, I know English and, and, and German and a bit of French and Swedish and uh, so on, but, but Russian um, is a challenge. Um, but I shared a lot of these uh, photographs on a Facebook page and uh, convinced people all around the world to, to sort of uh, as a crowd um, uh, not crowdfunding, but crowdsourcing, I guess you call it, uh, to, 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 to write to me what, what, was, uh, what was written. So we had um, almost all of them identified, and you can find all of them online at the National Museum of Denmark's uh, webpage. And we will provide a, um, a link to, uh, to these uh, digitized uh, photographs. There was also an entire library of 400 and some volumes of Russian military library that no one had looked at for, uh, for decades and which had just sat there in, in the attic as well. So amazing, amazing uh, stuff that's never been fully researched and is, is in many ways uh, only beginning to be opened up for, uh, for further research. So what I'm giving you now is sort of the background. How come this ended up in Copenhagen? What are 
the uniforms, uh, how much do we know about these uh, people who once uh, wore them? Um, but there is so much more. And uh, I, I hope that, that other researchers will, will, will come to Copenhagen and, and uh, have a closer look at this material because it is truly amazing. Uh, it, it is only very few of the objects from the collection that are currently on display in, in Copenhagen. Uh, that's the way it always is with uh, museums. We, we tend to look at, look at uh, ourselves as uh, sort of icebergs. You only see like a little portion above the water and then below the water you've got all the rest uh, that is kept in storage for uh, and kept for posterity. But of course, uh, all, of, all of that stuff is also really interesting. So that's why we need catalogs and, and, and research. But um, uh, there are two display cases. This is one of them uh, in which we have one of the, in the middle, one of the, the oldest uh, uniforms from the um, Inge Malensky uh, Hazars from the 1840s. And on the right, you've got the uh, an Imperial uh, Hazar uniform, um, uh, guards, Imperial Guards uniform, um, Hazars Guards uniforms that, that belonged originally to, uh, to uh, Prince uh, George uh, Yurievsky. So, um, so very, uh, a, a very interesting and, and, and unique uniform. And on the left, you've got a, uh, a, a uniform from, from the, uh, the Chevalier Guards uh, that you used to belong to, a guy called Heinigen Hühne. So objects with a clear provenance, provenance and in very, very uh, pristine condition. Once we began working with this, uh, it was like um, an adventure. I, 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 I like to think of it. Um, the, I, I very quickly realized that I wasn't able to, on my own, to, uh, to fully comprehend this. So um, through the uh, Russian embassy in Copenhagen, I invited some, some colleagues from the, the, the uh, National Museum in, in Moscow, the, the big red building on the Red Square. And uh, we had visits uh, from them and they were amazed at this, at this material. And, and some, of, some of these things you, you opened and had <laughs> never been opened. I mean, this little, little crate with a, with a um, uh, a little bust of, of, of Nicholas II. I, I'm sure it hadn't been opened since 1946. So, so in itself, it was just uh, a, a little little adventure uh, seeing what, what's underneath here, what, what's on this hangar. And, um, and I, I, I enjoyed it tremendously. Uh, and that, that, that's part of what I really love, uh, being a, a museum curator, exploring the um, the, uh, the collections. Uh, we even found the, the original trunk that, that uh, <laughs> some of these objects arrived to Copenhagen in back in uh, 1942 during World War II. I'll, I'll come into that uh, a bit uh, later. And um, once the exhibition had opened, I um, I, I I couldn't quite let go of this uh, this stuff. I I, I I was very curious what 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 this was um, and if and if it was possible to um, to find out more. And I looked in in our archives and and uh, through that I got in touch with the descendants of the general who uh, collected most of these objects, uh, who uh, lived, uh, live in, 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 in Great Britain. And I went and visited them. And 
I was welcomed. Uh, they were. I'm so grateful to the family, and I know that 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 uh, some of uh, the the family members are are, are watching here today. And, and I just have to tell you once again that uh, I am forever grateful for all the help that that uh, your family gave to me, because in this house there was not only porcelain and paintings and silverware and stuff, but there was also two uh, carrier bags waiting for me with a thousand pages unpublished uh, memoirs written in English. And they were, they, they, they gave me, they, they entrusted me with, with this material. So, so I, I went back home to Denmark and I scanned it all and uh, I worked with it for, uh, for months and months. And, and um, uh, with that material, I was able to, uh, to write uh, a, a biography of a general uh, Gudim Levkovich uh, and, and, and have it published in here in, in, in Denmark and explain why uh, on earth we have one of the finest collections of imperial Russian uniforms in the world in Denmark. Uh, and this adventure that, that sort of uh, lay behind that. Remember Dr. Shivago and Downton Abbey. So it was it was a, it was a thrill working with this. <clears throat> um, Paul Gadim Levkovich, who you uh, see in the photograph here, was born in uh, in eighteen seventy three in, in Saint Petersburg, and he was the son of of Captain Paul Konstantinovich Gadim Levkovich. Um, and for reasons I'll describe in a bit, he. Uh, was admitted into the uh, Corte Page in, um, in, in St. Petersburg, this very, very prestigious uh, school uh, or academy for uh, future officers. And the best of these, the most talented, the, the ones that got the highest marks were um, appointed to be pages, uh, like uh, attendants or adjutants for the uh, the imperial family and um, because he was at the very top of his class in 1893 to 94 he was the personal page of alexander the, the third and and so he personally knew the uh, the imperial family he'd, he'd actually met them and talked to them um he went on as a, a young uh, lieutenant, later a colonel, um, to fight in the uh, Russo-Japanese War and was wounded at the Battle of Mukden, uh, the, the, this huge uh, battle that took place in the spring of, of uh, 1905. And, uh, it was the, 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 the biggest uh, land battle since the, since the, the Battle of Leipzig in, in 1813. It was a huge uh, 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 battle. And here he was wounded, uh, simply a Japanese uh, bullet in his, uh, in his gut. And he, uh, he uh, had to, 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 to go to the... Uh, to the infirmary. I'll come to uh, to what happened uh, since then, but that was sort of that that was the the the, the story that sort of opened up uh, after we 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 uh, we worked with the uh, the exhibition, and uh, I had some time to 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 delve into this, uh, but it wasn't it it was clear to me that that after I had found out about the family history and 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 this uh, personal story I needed to know more about the collection because it sort of dawned on me that that there was a connection between 
some of the photographs and some of the uh, letters and some of the, the books in the collection with some of the uniforms and other objects in the collection. And uh, it was very frustrating to me that, that uh, <clears throat> they were they were very poorly registered. It, it, it only would sort of say the, the name of the regiment and the rank uh, and so on, but it wouldn't say very much about who had actually owned and worn uh, these, these uniforms. Um, and, and I hoped that it was possible to, to find out. And uh, so, uh, so there was quite a bit of detective work there. And, and that, I'm glad to say, has now uh, uh, resulted in in a uh, a catalog which has been which has been published uh, this year uh, by the uh, fund Ruski Vichazi, so it's a sort of a a fund that that uh, publishes this sort of of of, of catalogs, and uh, so this uh, four hundred and twenty page catalog. Is um, is dedicated to uh, to to the uh, to the, the collection in 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 Denmark, and uh, there are I, I think there's more than a thousand photographs in it, and and uh, very brief uh, descriptions of of each object. But at least that sort of opens uh, the material up to uh, to the interested uh, researcher and, and and reader and uh, as i said before it is it is uh, there among these these items there are some truly outstanding uh, objects but how did um, how did uh, uh, young gudimlevkovich uh, get access to the the um, the Corte Page. This was uh, really restricted to, to, to the high nobility and to sons of, of generals and war heroes. And, and, and uh, Gudim Levkovich's father was neither, but he was something else. He was the personal friend of Alexander III. Uh, old, uh, or Gudim Levkovich uh, senior, <laughs> um, was was uh, personally acquainted with with Alexander. He, they, he um, taught uh, strategy and 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 uh, history of warfare at the um, uh, war college in in Saint Petersburg, the General Staff College, and that. That was where he met the the Tsarevich before he became uh, became Tsar, and he accompanied him to the Russo-Turkish War in in 1878. So they were really good friends, and when um, Alexander uh, wanted a a, um, a teacher. In, in military affairs for his for his son, uh, the the Tsarevich uh, later uh, the the last Tsar Nicholas the the second, he uh, turned to his old friend uh, Gudim Levkovich, a senior. So so um, as a favor, he then admitted the son to the Corps de Page. So that was sort of. That was a way of fast forwarding him uh, into the, uh, the 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 highest echelons of of the Imperial Russian Army. Uh, the father went on to be a a, a minister uh, in, in in the uh, crowning committee, and uh, in Ilya Repin's huge painting in uh, in the Russian Museum in in Saint Petersburg, he is he is seated uh, right in front. Of of uh, uh, Nicholas the 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 second sort of half turned away from us, but uh, we know he's there. And um, in the collection in Copenhagen, we have this little uh, bow with the um, uh, with the imperial crown on it, and that is the um, that was sort of the the entry ticket to. Uh, 
to uh, that that sort of allowed you to be present at the coronation of uh, Nicholas uh, II. So uh, so that goes to explain how 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 that came there, and that goes also to explain what what sort of a family background that that um, that our general had. So the um, the court de page was uh, this this uh, highly prestigious uh, institution uh, where you had access to to the uh, imperial palaces and and you would wait on the uh, on the nobility and 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 the uh, 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 grand dukes and duchesses and so on. It 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 was uh, a fantastic uh, opportunity for uh, for. Um, to, to be part of that. And here's uh, one, I think, very charming picture uh, from, from the, the, um, uh, the academy. The academy is, uh, is still a military academy uh, in, in, in St. Petersburg. And here uh, you see his, uh, they, they would all wear this, uh, this badge uh, uh, <clears throat> that, that you see here on the right. And uh, on the left, uh, it's it, not uh, Grimlevkovich's personal uniform, but but one uh, out of a number. I think there are like three or four of of these uh, fantastically beautiful um, uh, uniforms that that were used by the cordepage. Uh, and the um, the gold uh, embroidery is, uh, makes them when you hold them in your hands, uh, they're just heavy. Um, and and it, they they must have glistened <laughs> in the ballrooms of of the uh, of the uh, winter palace during the uh, the balls where they of, of course also waited on the um, imperial highnesses. <clears throat> well, back in uh, Manchuria, well that was uh, very far from. From the ballrooms of 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 the palaces, uh, and uh, Kudim Levkovich uh, got to 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 know warfare firsthand, and and uh, uh, fortunately, we we have these wonderful uh, photographs of him uh, in the campaign. Uh, on the right hand side here, you see him on his horse uh, Julieta, and in, in the uh, this high grass that uh, was characteristic of of. Of the uh, the battlefields of of Manchuria, and uh, on the left you see him with uh, the nurses uh, at a field hospital. I'm not sure if this photo is actually taken after he was wounded or before, but he would certainly have uh, got very uh, closely acquainted with the field hospital uh, after he was he was wounded out there, and. Um, uh, he was, uh, of course, uh, uh, honored with, uh, with the uh, um, order of, of uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Stanislas, yes. Uh, uh, with a bow because it was uh, earned in warfare and and with uh, and with um, swords, as you see here, and this is his uh, uh, order uh, that he wore uh, on 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 his uh, portraits ever after because that that was the most to him the most important of of them all. Uh, you see it here on his uh, his, his portrait. And 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 now we're, this for me as a as a museum professional is is uh, is where I get really close to the person because th these are the the actual uniform tunics that that he wore. Uh, these are uh, the, the the tunics that you see on his uh, portraits on, and on his his um, his photographs on. On the very right hand side, you see this this uh, uh, winter uh, khaki uh, tunic uh, with with his uh, axelband or schnur, um, his agiet that that signified that he was uh, serving as uh, a military attaché to Greece uh, during uh, World War One, 
and uh, you can also see the the, the lighter uh, summer tunics that you would have uh, used for uh, for every day. And notice how on the uh, on the left sleeve you have uh, the uh, you have uh, a silver uh, band. Um, I'll just uh, there you see it more uh, closely, a silver band, which signified that he had been wounded in battle. So, so that, along with his uh, order, would, would, would sort of be the most important uh, uh, signs for him that, that sort of proved uh, his, his, his military uh, uh, honor. And here he stands in, in, in Greece with his, uh, his uh, son and daughter, uh, Paul Jr. and, and Kira. Uh, and so, it, it is a rare thing that you have not just one uniform that you can uh, attribute to one person, but actually <laughs> pretty much a wardrobe. Um, and you can even see that that uh, this one was sewn up for him at, in Salonika in, in Greece, Thessaloniki in, in present day Greece. Here he is with uh, his uh, wife. Uh, Evelyn and uh, the um, the two uh, the, the son and the daughter and and um, that uniform that you see him wearing there that's what we see here. Uh, this is uh, in the uh, collection in in Copenhagen, and yes, that is a very happy museum curator working with with uh, <laughs> an original uniform there on the on the left. So it's, uh, I find this uh, very fascinating. <clears throat> there you got it. I even found his Kiver, his, uh, his original hat. And who was this Evelyn that he, uh, he married and had, to, uh, had a son and a daughter with? Well, I found her portrait uh, also in the attic of, of the, uh, the Arsenal Museum. Uh, wrapped in cardboard and, and there was just a huge question mark on it who is this and, and um, uh, after a bit of detective uh, work I found that, that that was indeed a very friendly portrait of, of Evelyn. I'm not sure she'd looked that um, uh, beautiful in, in, in real life um, but she certainly was a character and she has also left um, some of her memoirs so uh, so we can sort of follow this couple both uh, from his side and from her side. And uh, we've even got a newspaper snapshot here on the right of uh, him uh, uh, and his bride when they were married in, in London in 1906. At that marriage, uh, Evelyn uh, Green was her name. Was uh, was taken up uh, to uh, the uh, the altar, not by her father because her father had uh, had died and uh, her mother had also died, and her mother uh, happened to be uh, first cousins with Winston Churchill. So we're in the, the very highest uh, social uh, strata of, of British society around year 1900. And um, she had this huge uh, villa in, in, uh, in Cannes. And Grim Levkovich had gotten to know uh, Evelyn Green in Cannes. And why on earth was he in Cannes? Well, that was because of the gentleman that you see on these two photographs, uh, Grand Duke uh, Mikhail Mikhailovich of, of Russia. Um, he had one job, basically, and that was to find uh, an honorable wife and have some kids with her. Uh, he did eventually, after many, many uh, uh, problems. Uh, he, he did find himself a wife, uh, Countess uh, Toby. 
she was a countess and uh, she was even uh, related to, to the great uh, poet uh, Pushkin, but she wasn't royal. She wasn't imperial. She was just too low ranking. And uh, the Tsar and Tsarina uh, were very disappointed with him and he was expelled from Russia. So the poor guy had to uh, live his life in Cannes, of all places, um, and he started the tennis club and he started the, the first golf course uh, at the Mediterranean, La Vieille Course. I've been there. It's, uh, their logo is, uh, is, is still the imperial eagle of, of, of the um, Russian imperial family. And he had this uh, lovely big uh, uh, villa, Villa Kazbek, named after the Kazbek uh, mountain in, in Georgia. His father had been the viceroy of, of Georgia. And uh, he, um, he had a huge income from the Borjomi uh, mineral water factory uh, there that he owned. So, uh, so that... Um, that funded his lavish lifestyle in in uh, in Cannes, and he was uh, uh, generally known as the uncrowned king of Cannes. So uh, so he lived a pleasant life, and he uh, he liked Evelyn, um, but he also wanted to do something to the war effort. He wanted to contribute contribute to the war effort uh, in the Russo-Japanese War. And since he wasn't allowed to return to, to, uh, to Russia, his contribution to the war effort was to make sort of a, um, a, uh, a luxury hospital uh, for uh, 60 wounded uh, Russian officers. And one of the lucky uh, patients there was Paul William Levkovich. And so when he was uh, re reconvalescing in, in, in Cannes, that was when he met Evelyn. And Evelyn introduced him in turn to the Grand Duke and also to the Grand Duke's sister. Um, by the way, in the closets in, uh, in, in Copenhagen, uh, I found the, uh, the tunic uh, and the hat of, of uh, Mikhail Mikhailovich. You can see his monogram there inside. Uh, and um, this is the tunic from the Yegersky uh, regiment in which he served as a, as a general. And uh, you can see uh, the, uh, all the knots where all the, uh, the countless uh, orders and, and, and medals would have been, would have been fastened. So, um, so that's his, his uh, uniform that, that, that I found there. And, and th this is one of the instances where I could sort of uh, tie the, um, the, the personal history of the general uh, together with some of the, the, some of the objects in the collection. It, uh, also, when, when I rummaged uh, through some of the, uh, the weapons in the collection, I came across this one, which was just registered as a sword. And uh, it um, uh, was pretty obvious to me that uh, the inlaid uh, MM monogram with the uh, imperial crown and the, the 20th birthday date of the, uh, the, the Grand Duke that was uh, his very personal uh, sword, uh, which just happened to lie there among so many other swords. So, so it, was, um, it, it was like an, an, an adventure uh, looking through this, this collection. Also, uh, in the many, many uh, uh, photographs uh, that, I, that I also found, uh, in many of them, uh, Mikhail Mikhailovich would, would, would feature very prominently. You see, you see him sitting here in, in, the, in the middle uh, on this uh, officer's uh, or uh, this military uh, portrait from back in the day when he was uh, not yet expelled from, from, from Russia. Um, the sister. <clears throat> Uh, Mikhail Mikhailovich's sister was Grand Duchess uh, Anastasia Mikhailovich, and she had uh, married uh, the uh, Frederick Franz, the 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 Grand Duke of of uh, uh, 
uh, this uh, uh, it'll come to me in a minute. This, this northern German uh, 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 duchy, um, and and um, he he. Um, but he he would it wasn't a very happy marriage uh, let's say that but um and and uh, there was one thing that the, the 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 two could sort of agree on and that was that they really didn't want to spend very much more time in in uh, in northern germany in schwerin mecklenburg schwerin that's it uh, in, in mecklenburg schwerin uh, then then they absolutely had to the rest of the time they preferred to uh, stay in can where they bought a uh, a villa right next door to uh, the brother uh, Mikhail, so um, so they had this sort of little uh, Russian uh, uh, grand ducal colony going in 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 this neighborhood in in, in Cannes, and um, <clears throat> this was where uh, Friedrich Franz uh, died. Uh, unfortunately, he fell off the balcony and and and, and died, probably in a, a fit of uh, fever, and was found by a cab driver. And um, Anastasia wasn't very well liked uh, back home in, in northern Germany, so she basically just uh, decided to stay the rest of her life in 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 uh, in Cannes, or the most of the rest of her life. And and she she um, they had they had three. Uh, three children, um, the um, the last Archduke of uh, of, of Mecklenburg Schwerin, and uh, Louisa, the uh, who married the um, the Crown Prince of uh, Prussia, and then uh, Alexandrina, who became uh, the Queen of Denmark. So there we have the first tie to Denmark. Uh, Alexandrina sits here on the uh, the left uh, in, in this group portrait, and and her mother uh, Anastasia sits with uh, with the young Frederick, later Frederick the Ninth of of Denmark, on her lap, and then in between them they have the young Prince Christian, later Christian the Tenth of Denmark, and. Um, through Evelyn Green and uh, Mikhail Mikhailovich and Anastasia, uh, Gudim Levkovich knew the future Danish uh, queen, Alexandrina, uh, from his uh, prolonged stays in, in, uh, in, in the south of France. So, so that sort of li lays the, 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 the groundwork for the, uh, for the eventual transfer of all these uniforms to, to Copenhagen. Um, she became quite a scandalous uh, figure. Uh, here she's standing, uh, Anastasia, uh, next to a, uh, a young Russian uh, pilot that she uh, scandalously uh, uh, had an affair with. She had also an affair with her private secretary, uh, Paltov, and, and, and had e even a child with him. Um, and uh, she she's sort of an, a, a bit of an overlooked uh, character, but I, I think a very fascinating character in, in, the, uh, in the Danish royal family. Uh, she, is, she is indeed the, the, the present Queen Margrethe's scandalous uh, great-grandma, and, um, and uh, she's also a, a fascinating character in, in the imperial uh, Russian family. So, I'll skip uh, sort of uh, the most of, of Gudim Levkovich's career. Uh, just uh, suffice it to say that he he was a um, a, uh, a military attaché to, to to Greece, uh, and uh, there is much to be told about that, but we don't have enough time. Um, he was eventually uh, he, he eventually went to to Russia and served in um, the general staff in, in, in St. Petersburg in, in 1917, uh, when, when he was appointed a Lieutenant General uh, during the uh, Kerensky uh, uh, government. Uh, but he managed to get out of, uh, of Russia before uh, uh, the, 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 uh, everything turned really bad for uh, 
for the nobility and 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 uh, sort of the the old regime's uh, uh, representatives. So um, and went back to uh, to Britain, uh, where Evelyn and and the children were, and and then they went uh, to live in 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 uh, France, just south of uh, of Cannes, in a little village called Lanapul. And there, their house sort of became a, a focus point for uh, for uh, the exiled nobility and for exiled uh, uh, officers, Imperial Russian officers. And they they gathered in his uh, big uh, home, um, and uh, and that was where he uh, began collecting all these uniforms. And we have uh, many. Uh, uh, photos of 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 uh, this is a, a more jolly uh, one of them, uh, where you can see them wearing uh, uh, some of these uniforms and a reconstructed uh, uniform from the 18th century, and um, and uh, he became part of 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 this uh, big uh, group of 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 exiled uh, Russian uh, officers that were active in 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 France in the 19. 20s and uh, 30s, like uh, you see here at this gathering. Uh, uh, in the middle here, you see uh, seated the general that uh, Dmitry Osnobishin, who was the last um, military attaché, Russian imperial military attaché, to to to, Gre uh, to, uh, to France uh, uh, before the uh, the revolution. And here again, uh, our. Uh, General is uh, seen uh, on the on the second to the to the uh, right um, with with a number of of um, nobility and officers at a gathering at Lanapul in, in in France. And each, of course, wearing the hat of of his old uh, regiment. So uh, so that uh, says something about the character of of this um, this this. Uh, museum that he created there. Uh, I can't tell you about all of the uniforms. This uh, one uh, interesting here. I I, I think this is uh, the general uh, from the horse guards artillery, um, uh, Ivan Bagavut, uh, photographed in his uh, his uniform with all his medals and 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 uh, uh, in in France. In 1933, so these people would attend uh, dinners and soirees and and, and uh, theater shows and, and so on uh, for regimental dinners and 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 other services, wearing their original uh, imperial Russian uniforms in the 1920s and even 1930s. Interestingly, the uh, the tunic that you can see here on the right, uh, we can see, is actually sewn. In exile in France, but they they needed to they they desperately wanted to to hold on to their um, their identity as imperial uh, Russian uni uh, Russian uh, uh, officers. So so uh, so so that so there you go. Asnobishin, you that we saw in another in an earlier photo, you you have here again uh, his first uh, uh, uniform from the. Uh, from the Grodno Hussars, uh, we have his his photograph in the collection, and we have his entire uh, uniform um, preserved. And we also have his 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 uh, other uh, uniforms in in the collection, complete with hats and uh, shoulder boards and epaulets and everything. And uh, he seems to have been a great collector of hats and headgear. And they, he, he made sure to mark them all with his initial D.O. Um, so um, so uh, quite a few of, of the, um, the hats in the collection haven't, have been owned by him, but uh, not used by him because he weren't in all those regiments. But there you go. Um, he had several uniforms and, and they're almost all uh, completely preserved. Now I'll just very briefly uh, go through some of these uh, some of these um, objects that we or 
some some of some of the pages of the um, of the uh, catalog that we have uh, published uh, this year. As you can see, uh, it, it's only very uh, short um, descriptions that we had uh, room for because we really wanted to include as many uh, photographs of the um, of the objects as as, as possible. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, they are extremely well preserved, most of them, and, and you will not find uh, many in the world that, that can rival them in, 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 in this uh, uh, pristine con condition. Um, the uh, the um, catalog also, uh, when we knew who the uh, the original owners of the uniforms were, uh, we would include uh, that, and and uh, we'd even um, give a brief uh, a brief biography of 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 the uh, of the original owner. And as you can see, all objects are uh, described in Russian, English, and uh, Danish. So. Um, so uh, we're very, very happy to sort of open up this, uh, this big collection to, uh, to a, uh, an international audience. Again, here you see uh, Asnabishin as an example with his uh, trousers and his hat and his, uh, his epaulets and so forth, and a portrait of him wearing those very uniform objects. Uh, one of the most spectacular uh, uh, uniforms in the collection uh, is this one that was originally owned by uh, an Alexander Atsumanov, of whom we don't know very much, but he was in the uh, uh, Grand Duke of Saxe Weimar's Hussar Regiment, also known as the Ingermanland Hussars. And um, he is uh, photographed a very early photograph uh, from uh, 1849, wearing these very same uh, uniform objects. That is uh, quite outstanding, and the um, the uh, the uniform is is uh, is virtually complete. I mean, it, it lacks the the boots and 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 the sword, but apart from that it's it's uh, it's complete even with the uh, the overcoat the, the vengerka and 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 the police and everything um so it, that's one of the sort of the stars of the collection um here we have him we're getting close to to the end uh, sitting in in um, in copenhagen in uh, 1945 demonstrating how you uh, how you make Tin soldiers, toy soldiers. He, it, uh, you might have thought that with this fantastic collection of uniforms, that that was the uh, the main focus of Godim Levkovich's uh, uh, collection, but it wasn't. Uh, he did uh, convince all the uh, the exiled officers that he he knew. And got in touch with, or uh, also, also oh, via, uh, I mean, correspondence, um, to uh, to 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 donate their original uniforms to his collection, um, and he called it the Imperial uh, Russian Army Museum. It was a, an outstanding collection. It became a, a, a famous collection in its time, um, and it was in the house in Lenapool until 1942. But then he got worried. Uh, the war um, warfare was coming closer and he, he was not certain that uh, his house, which was right next to the beach, uh, wouldn't be uh, seized by the, uh, by the Germans in case of uh, an invasion scare. And uh, who would have known what would have become of the uh, the uniforms and and the rest of the stuff in in that case? So via the uh, 
the old uh, uh, colleague, uh, the, 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 the last uh, military attaché uh, of the empire in, um, in Denmark, he, uh, he got in touch with the, uh, the Danish Arsenal Museum and he managed to uh, ship the whole collection in crates and trunks with, uh, with um, a train from the south of France through <laughs> war-torn Europe to Copenhagen, where it was safe. And he himself followed and arrived in August of 1943 to Copenhagen. And the very, very first thing he did was to go to an audience with the Danish queen, Alexandrina. And they would, of course, have spoken Russian and reminisced on uh, days past at the Riviera, where they had spent time together. And um, so he lived in 1944 and 45 and experienced the, uh, the liberation of Europe in Copenhagen. And uh, he donated the entire collection to uh, the Arsenal Museum there. And the main thing was the collection of toy soldiers. He had recreated the, uh, the May Parade of 1881 before the, in his mind, scandalous uh, uniform, uh, uh, the new uniform regulation uh, in, in, in 1883, where uh, so many regiments um, uh, changed into to more modern uh, uniform garb. Um, so he recreated it as, as he uh, remembered what his, his childhood's officers and, and soldiers had looked like. And there were thousands, there were more than 2,000 uh, toy soldiers, tin soldiers, only this big, and arranged them in this big parade in this huge display case. And um, the museum in Copenhagen promised him that there would be an exhibition, that this would be a permanent museum. But they didn't keep the promise. Um, and he was, he died in 1954, a very bitter man. He was very, very disappointed with the museum in Copenhagen that they hadn't uh, made this museum that they had promised him. And the last thing he did was that he um, instructed his son to, uh, to get the collection of toy soldiers from the, uh, the museum in Copenhagen and ship them to New York to a Count Igor Cassini, a very scandalous uh, person uh, of Russian nobility who uh, had married into a, uh, an Italian noble family, uh, hence the name Cassini. Uh, who was uh, the father of modern talk shows and gossip journalism, and who um, uh, he was uh, he was the one who uh, originally coined the phrase "jet set" uh, of uh, about uh, uh, the rich and the famous. Um, he received these um, these uh, toy soldiers. I have tried to get in touch with the family. Um, uh, they've not responded. Uh, th th there are some still uh, living members of the family, but he, Cassini was was uh, married and divorced, I think, twice, uh, uh, five times. So, um, uh, and and I think maybe a Danish uh, researcher asking about old toy soldiers uh, that they they must have thought thought this is crazy. But but now in in uh, among. Uh, this audience here tonight, um, please, if anybody knows what became of the 2000 toy soldiers, uh, I'd be really, really happy to, uh, to know. Um, just rounding off, uh, he died in 1954. He's buried in uh, Lanapool uh, in, 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 in the south of France. 
in Copenhagen at the Assistenz Kirkegård, the, uh, the uh, main cemetery of, of Copenhagen, we have the exile uh, community of, of, of Russians. They have their own part of the, the cemetery. And here, this is really interesting. You can see uh, the headstones uh, with the names, and uh, I can check the, the, the registration cards for the uh, uniforms. And I can say, well, yeah, that's Kotya, Kotyarevsky's uh, grave here. This is Kotyarevsky's uh, tunic. Here, a very famous person, the, 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 um, the last uh, uh, life uh, Cossack uh, guard of, uh, of, of Empress Maria Fyodorovna, Timofey Yashik. Uh, this is his grave, and uh, we have his his um, his uniform here, uh, baby, or uh, I, I guess off-duty uniform. Uh, uh, I guess he's buried in his proper uniform, which is is not, I'm afraid, uh, uh, extant. And now we have the uh, the at long last the the. Uh, uh, catalog published uh, for for all of you to uh, to uh, peruse and then enjoy and and uh, and you can see how this links with the um, with the general history of well the russian military the imperial russian military uh, the imperial russian army with the uh, personal stories of a number of of um, uh, russian officer families and uh, well, just enjoy the uh, the fantastic quality and the colors and the the the, uh, the aesthetics of of the uh, the Russian uh, uh, Imperial Army. And first and foremost, I really like to uh, to extend my my gratitude to uh, to the Gudim family for um, for opening the, their doors to me. Here we have uh, uh, Paul and, and Susie and, and Paul uh, regrettably has passed away now and, and uh, but uh, uh, I'm so happy that he uh, he uh, gave me access to uh, to the, the documents that could that, that could help me unfold his uh, family's fantastic uh, history and thank you very much for um, for looking uh, for 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 following this uh, this talk here uh, today, and and um, I'm now happy to to answer any any questions. <laughs>